This is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantu. Let's say you make $500,000 a year. That puts you in the top 1% of all Americans and far ahead of almost everyone else in the world. Angels star Mike Trout is finalizing a deal to stay with that team for another 12 years and to earn $430 million over that time. $430 million over 12 years, or $36 million a year, which makes your $500,000 look measly. As we walk through the world, we are constantly comparing and contrasting our lives with those of others. This week on Hidden Brain, the psychology of inequality. Keith Payne is a psychologist at the University of North Carolina. The researchers looked at data from millions of flights to look at what predicted incidents of air rage. That is, cases where passengers were unruly or disruptive or violent in some way. And they found that in planes that had a first-class cabin... Incidents of air rage were several times more likely to happen than in uh, flights that didn't have a first-class cabin, which suggests that to witness that inequality seems to have some kind of psychological effect on people that really ramps up the disruptive behavior. Now, it's worth noting that planes with a first-class cabin might be larger with more passengers and longer flights. More people and more time spent in the air could also increase the likelihood of air rage. But there are some other indications that seeing the inequality between first class and coach does affect passengers. And so it's that feeling that not only do I not have something that other people have, but I deserve that thing that other people have that makes that relative comparison so much more painful. Why is it that the comparisons we make are invariably upward comparisons? So if the folks in coach are comparing themselves to the folks in first class, the folks in first class are probably comparing themselves to the folks who fly private jets. There's uh, a a pronounced tendency we have to make upward comparisons in all areas of life. And it's not always the case. I remember whenever, you know, there's stories in the press about inequality and you, and you read the comment section, you, you will event, invariably find someone, you know, writing in from New York's Upper West Side saying, you know, a million dollars isn't what you think it is. That same dynamic happens all up and down the, so, the, the income ladder. Now, we increasingly live in a world where you have extremes of inequality. What do you mean by the broken ladder? One of the images that I use throughout uh, the book to capture the relative differences between people is this idea of a status ladder, that we think about ourselves uh, in terms of being on a certain rung with some people above us and other people below us. That's right. If you look at actual income changes over the last uh, 40 or 50 years, the people in the, the middle group, who we might consider sort of middle class incomes, haven't made any more or less on average than they did back in the 1960s and 70s. The the poorest groups and the middle class groups are basically staying the same, but that stagnation feels like people are falling behind by comparison to the top 20%, the top 10%, and the top 1% who have made so much more money over the last several decades. So staying in place feels like falling behind if other people are getting so much further ahead. In other words, feelings of opulence and poverty are not merely shaped by objective facts. An individual making around $50,000 a year is in the top 1% of all incomes globally. In the United States, people earning that much don't feel like one percenters. When we come back, how these feelings affect our lives. We react with stress responses as if we were about to face a literal physical challenge. And the total of all of those effects Uh, adds up to feeling that we're constantly in crisis. Tell me about the difference in the homicide rate between countries that are equal and countries that are less equal. If you look across countries, um, one of the strong predictors of homicide rates, as well as other kinds of violent crime, is the level of income inequality uh, in those countries. Now, we have to make an important distinction here between wealthy developed countries uh, and poorer countries, uh, because in poor countries, the best predictor of crime and lots of other um, bad health and social outcomes is actually poverty, because we're talking about countries in which uh, poor people 
may not have their basic physical needs met. But when we look at wealthy countries, like the countries of Western Europe and North America, poverty ceases to be the strong predictor of things like homicide rates, and inequality becomes the stronger predictor. Because once people's basic physical needs are met, it becomes the relative comparisons to other people that becomes one of the major stressors that affect people. Now, of course, it's important to mention that some of these findings are correlations. You're basically looking at patterns. You're not actually conducting an experiment where you're varying how unequal people are and then measuring the outcomes in things like homicide. But tell me about another correlation that that people have looked at uh, that has to do with politics, the relationship between inequality and political polarization. If you compare either across countries or within the United States over time, you see a pretty strong correlation between the level of income inequality Inequality and the level of political polarization. So it's not that inequality makes people more conservative or more liberal uh, per se. It's that people who are already in those on those sides go further into their corners when inequality is high. What's driving the the fact that people are retreating into their separate camps? There seems to be a back and forth dynamic between how much money people have and what they see around them and how certain they feel in their own uh, opinion. You know, as I was preparing for this interview, Keith, I came by this interesting study that Daniel Zizzo had conducted. He gave money to volunteers. Some got more, some got less. And he found that volunteers were willing to spend their own money if it allowed them to reduce the money that other people had. Zizzo called this burning other people's money. And he found that a substantial number of people were willing to reduce their own wealth if they could also reduce the wealth of other people. In other words... Inequality has such strong effects on us that we are willing to make great sacrifices to level the playing field. And from an economic uh, point of view, that's just crazy behavior, right? But from a psychological point of view, it makes perfect sense because we're not judging these things the way an accountant or an economist would. We're thinking, what do I have compared to what that other guy has? And that relative sense of... of, um, entitlement and having enough compared to what other people have is so powerful. Keith, the researchers Michael Norton and Dan Ariely once asked volunteers what kind of a country they would like to live in. The first option was a country where the top 20% own a third of the wealth and the bottom 20% own 10% of the wealth. Option two, the top 20% own 84% of the wealth, the bottom 20% own 0.1% of the wealth. What did the volunteers say? Most people chose, uh, by an overwhelming margin, the more equal option. I asked Keith why this preference for equality doesn't get translated into policy. What explains the mismatch between what we say we want and what we do? Well, the important thing in that study was that the... um, the charts demonstrating those different levels of inequality were not labeled, right? And so if you were to add the labels that this is the United States and that's Sweden, now people would start sorting themselves out um, and choosing the United States or Sweden based on their beliefs. Well, if you look at teams, whether it's uh, baseball or basketball, that have extreme levels of inequality, which are driven by paying superstars astronomical salaries, they don't outperform other teams that have more equality. And that's counterintuitive if you think that paying the superstars huge salaries means that they're going to, you know, work harder and perform better. You would expect uh, better scores and more wins. But in fact, in team sports like that, higher levels of inequality and extreme pay for the superstars is associated with poorer performance in subsequent seasons. And of course, this uh, idea might be explained with what you said earlier, which is that even if you buy the idea that maybe the superstar does perform very well, the resentment and unfairness that others experience might come at a cost to the team's performance. That's right. Uh, The newspaper, the Sacramento Bee, published the salaries of every California state employee. Uh, What happened when people discovered that they were being paid less or more than other people who were working uh, for the state of California? The effects of learning um, what you made in comparison to what other people made depended on whether you were a high earner or a low earner to begin with. So uh, people who were uh, below average, when they learned that other people were making much more than them, they felt very dissatisfied. 
people who uh, were higher up uh, when they found out how well they were doing compared to other people. Ironically, it didn't have the same effect. If, the, if your idea is that uh, pay inequity increases performance, you should want total transparency. And yet what we have is a system in which most companies, most organizations want to keep their pay inequality secret. And the social norms are not to talk about these things, which means that at some level, we must kind of know that there's something else going on besides just incentivizing good performance. We know uh, at some level that there's uh, this negative feeling uh, surrounding talking about differences in pay and that, that that's likely to have some bad outcomes as well. When, when you looked at the example of the aircraft uh, studies that you told me, uh, uh, told me about at the start of our conversation, uh, it, it, you mentioned that in aircraft that do not board you know, passengers from the front or aircrafts that don't have first-class cabin at all, uh, you have fewer of these of these problems. Now, of course, you're going to have rich people and slightly less rich people on those airplanes as well. It raises the question again, if you have inequalities in a society, an organization, a community, are we better off making them visible or better off keeping them invisible? There's no simple answer because on the one hand, um, when people uh, are economically segregated and you have the, the wealthy living behind uh, gated communities and, and very separate from the way ordinary people are living and the way poor people are living, uh, it might be psychologically easier on the middle class and the poor people not to see that. But on the other hand, it creates a greater feeling of distance between the haves and have-nots and less of a feeling of community. And, you know, that leads to increased polarization and lower levels of trust. So there's no simple answer uh, in terms of whether we want uh, highly visible or highly transparent uh, inequality versus less visible and less less transparent inequality because uh, there's always a trade-off at work between what feels good versus what has negative consequences down the road. For more Hidden Brain, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. If you like this episode, please be sure to share it with a friend. I'm Shankar Vedantam, and this is NPR.